Okay, so um, I'm going to stick around and help you navigate questions and stuff from the audience, but I know you've got some slides to share. So um, Leanne and I will be here to back you up, but we'll let you. They're, they're really pumped about hearing yeah. from you. So <laughs> you. Um, they are excited to hear your story. Uh, they're referring to you as the goat, the man, <laughs> the legend. Um, people are pretty, pretty excited. <laughs> well, and to our to our viewers send us some questions because brian will be taking a few at the end so yep. post them yep all right we're gonna back off give you some space but we'll be here okay awesome cool so everybody thank you guys for finding the time to be here and again i'm honored and privileged to be here um i do want to preface a little bit that i'm trying to recover from a cold so if i cough in a little bit in between or my voice goes i apologize but i'll try my best to kind of just stay put here together um but yeah it's an honor and a privilege to be here you know i've been writing with medical school HQ and now Matt for a while and they really do um, do a lot of things behind the scenes that have made me who I am today um, and I'll be sharing a little bit of my journey uh, for the people who are new for the people who know me people who are on know that my journey from hood to MD has been um, you know a journey has really tested my willpower more times than I can count um, you know I feel like everybody's journey is different but my journey has definitely tested me in, in ways that um, you know, I'm here to just share it, you know, socially, familially, personally, professionally. It's been a lot of barriers, but if this is what you want to do, I'm here to tell you guys that it is possible and it is and you are capable. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started here. I did a little, a little slide, a uh, PowerPoint presentation, kind of put my journey and, and the big picture together. Um, now, there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of things that obviously happen in between some of these things that I just can't capture at all, but I'm going to try my best here to share it with you guys. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, as I get started, I want to give you guys kind of a purpose again as to why I'm doing this and some disclaimers. First and foremost, I want to say like that this is, think of it basically like a case study, everything that I'm showing you guys. Think of it like a case study in the sense that this is just my journey, my story, and my path from where I was to where I am into medicine. Um, and don't think of it as like a Bible. Don't think of it as like this is what you need to do. Everybody's story is different. Every, everyone has a different journey. Um, you know, everyone's battles are, are differently and they have their own worth in a way. So don't, you know, try to start comparing, contrasting, um, kind of how you guys, Leanne and uh, Rachel kind of started. I share my story with you guys and I'm here today because, you know, I want to be as transparent and vulnerable as possible in hopes that it serves as a beacon of hope um, for those of you facing similar battles, kind of going through the same things. I know what it was like when I started this journey, um, how dark it was, you know, to be, to feel a certain way, right? To, to be going for this astronomical goal, being the first in my family to do this, um, and that's just the, the social aspect of the battle, right? There's still the, the GPA, the academic, the personal, professional battles. And so, you know, it's, I know how hard, how dark it can be. And this is why I'm sharing it to let you guys know that it does get better. And within all the darkness is always going to be light. Um, and again, so sharing this because uh, it's not for you to compare or contrast. It's for you to always remember that the only person you're really going to be fighting for or fighting against and battle with is a person, is you versus the person in the mirror. Um, it's always going to be, you know, you and how you stay accountable, how you stay responsible, things that you do on an everyday basis, just to remind yourself, you know, that's not to compare or contrast. And again, collaboration, not competition, the infamous quote from MSQ, um, MSHQ. So again, this is just to help empower um, the next person that's kind of going through similar battles. And, um, you know, diversity, even though some might say I'm an epitome of it, right? As a, as a first generation, as a Latino, um, going into medicine, but diversity is always going to be the experiences of their life and the, the experience of your life and how you live through it through your lens. Everybody has different experiences, no matter how you identify, no matter what you go through. Those are things that are going to obviously forge you and shape you depending on how you react to it. Um, and more so, for, so formal, and lastly, like the most important thing is that what I really want you guys to take home from today is that you are more than the numbers that try to define you. And what I mean by that is my whole life I've been faced with statistics. I've been faced with the, the being the outlier with such a low GPA, a low MCAT, being a first generation, everything, right? So I want you to know that no matter what the statistics say, no matter what the population says about what was going to be destined for you, you are more than that, and you are supposed to be the outlier. So I'll go ahead and get started here a little bit with my introduction as to who I am, right? So my name, again, is Brian Torres, and I'm here to tell you guys, right, my journey from being a statistic to now being a newly admitted and rising first year medical student. Um, along this journey, you know, as I said, is measuring my character and my willpower more times than I can count. And I am who I am today because of the culmination, the culmination of the things that I've lived through, my community, my experiences that help forge the person I am today and the physician that I aspire to be. And again, ultimately, I want you guys to always take home that you are more than numbers that try to define you, that try but do not define you. And I survive because the fire inside me, it burns bright in the fire around me. 
And so that willpower, that strength always kind of kept me going. And again, it's not always going to be easy. I know it's easier said than done here now that I'm on this side. But again, you got to remember why you're doing what you're doing. And so kind of, a, again, short version of you know who I am, right? So my inconceivable dream of wanting to become a physician started when I was 15 years old. At that point, at this point right now, it's 13 years ago. I'm 28 years old now. And after 10 years on this journey, when I really started the premed path on about 2010, um, you know, going to three application cycles in 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, taking MCAT five times over the last five years and still not breaking 500. Undergraduate with an undergraduate science GPA of 2.69. It probably was lower than that, but now it's 2.69 because of some do-it-yourself post back credits, which I'll get into. Doing a master's degree, uh, having a total of eight medical school interviews over the last three application cycles, being on three wait lists. I finally received the life-changing acceptance to multiple medical schools. And I'm going to become a student doctor soon this fall. And so and uh, thankfully one day be a physician. So this is kind of my, my too long uh, dinner read version. And now kind of break down my journey from where I was to where I am. And so a little bit about me. I want to just tell you guys again, uh, first generation. I am a Latino and I'm a, I'm a son of uh, immigrant parents from Mexico and Colombia. My mom is from Mexico. I'm seeing a lot specifically. My dad from Colombia. I was born in California. and I was But I was raised, uh, raised in uh, Maryville, which is... Uh, an area in West Valley, Phoenix, that's predominantly Hispanic and socioeconomically disadvantaged community. Um, and I grew up in a single parent home. I became a, my mom became a single parent when I was three years old and we moved from California from Hayward to uh, Phoenix. And that's kind of where I was ultimately was raised and made. Um, again, I'm a first generation American, high school, college and master's graduate. And I'm the first in my entire family to pursue higher education in medicine. Um, over time from being a statistic, I ultimately became an engineer because I studied engineering in my undergraduate. I became a researcher doing my master's degree and, and a lot of my professional experiences. And now I'm going to soon become a doctor or a medical student one day become a doctor. Um, and all these things, the culmination of all this theme, my journey, my evolution uh, has led me to a lifelong commitment to helping address some of the health, social, and educational inequities that afflict a lot of, especially first generation minorities and disadvantaged applicants. Um, outside of the professional and seriousness, um, you know, I enjoy a lot of the things that involve physical and mental growth. Uh, physically, you know, I like, like everybody else trying to just work on my health, go to the gym, work on weights and cardio. I recently started dabbling um, in yoga and I'm trying to do a little bit more cycling. That's kind of my goal in the fall to kind of keep those non-negotiables in medical school. Uh, mentally, again, uh, yoga is something I've been trying to dabble with. Um, it is a mental battle, as some of you know, yogis know. I'm an avid reader, an avid uh, audio book and podcaster, ultimately kind of plug in medical school HQ. Um, really, you know, a lot of the, the content is, is literally worth its weight in gold. Um, and outside of that, you know, try to travel when, we, when I can. Obviously, with the pandemic, it's been a lot harder, but I'm hoping that there's a lot more travel leisure. I like to spend some time outdoors, again, just remembering, um, you know, nature and whatnot. And, you know, I like good craft brews, good wine. And, yeah, it's a little bit of me outside of the seriousness. But I'm going to go a little bit more into my upbringing and my seed, right? Everybody has a story as to why they pursue med medicine. What is the first thing that kind of got you like? That aha moment. Um, for me, uh, I, again, my I said like in the beginning, my community ultimately made me who I am. Um, growing up in, in Maryville, as I mentioned, it was a predominant Hispanic, um, socioeconomic Spanish community. Um, and a lot of people there, you know, we kind of grow up devoid of positive role models. Uh, many of us unfortunately fall victims to gun violence, drugs, um, incarceration. And so being around this area kind of just made me realize like, like wow, these things happened to me. Like I wanted to do more for the people in my community and for myself. I didn't know that I wanted to do medicine yet, but that's kind of what started getting me think of like, wanting to do more for myself and others. Um, you know, throughout my, once I had that dream, I'm trying to do something I knew that I needed to pursue higher education. But throughout my entirety in my, in my public school education, I was not college bound. I was statistically more likely to drop out than I was to graduate. Um, and through that, um, you know, out of my class of a thousand students that started my freshman year in high school, about 650 was graduated. So almost about 40 to 50% the people that went to my high school dropped out um and i get more into how many of us went to higher education um but also on the health aspect of it another thing that really inspired me or, or was really a moving seed was that in my community there was not a lot of access to health care um a lot of people that uh, we had a local hospital it was called maribel hospital but over the years it kind of fell bankrupt um, to multiple healthcare systems over three or four times and so they didn't adequately serve the area and a lot of the patients that were seeing happened to be gunshot wounds gsws or teens that are, pre, uh, that are prematurely fostered into parenthood, um, or a lot of people who, you know, in my community, predominantly Hispanic, a lot of people who um, 
were immigrants and like they, they scared or they scared and they feared seeking medical care at the risk of being deported. And so a lot of them didn't really seek out the care. A lot of my own family, we usually went to a curandero, we didn't really go to the hospital. And so a lot of those things kind of came into fruition of me wanting to pursue medicine. Um, there's a lot more factors into it, but that's kind of like the gist of why I wanted to pursue it. Um, and out of uh, um, and out of that, right, like I didn't really go to the hospital again, unless we, we went to, if we, were, we went to Purandero, if we were really sick, we went to go see a doctor. But even then, I still don't really remember seeing a pediatrician until I was like 13 years old. Um, and so when I did see him, you know, my lack of interaction with a lot of doctors that looked like me or came from my racial or social class made me question if I wasn't even equipped for societal roles. But again, I knew that I wanted to pursue this. I knew that I needed to go to college to get to higher education. And ultimately, I was one of seven, um, about a half of about seven or 12 out of 650 students that even made it to higher, uh, higher education out of 650. Um, but a lot of my motivation to thinking that I was capable of becoming a physician because my environment didn't show it to me, you know, very few people go to college, yet alone no one has ever gotten an MD from my high school, um, was I did a summer program, a summer enrichment program at my local medical school um, called MedStar, and this is uh, MedStar, and this is in 2010. And through this program, they chose about 24 of us throughout the valley who are, um, you know, underrepresented in medicine, who come from like a socioeconomic disadvantaged background, and they kind of put us through this boot camp for eight weeks, learning about all the different types of health professions. And here you have, some, I have some pictures, um, just kind of showing what it was like, what I looked like in 2010. Um, and like this program really made me aware of what it takes to become a nurse, a doctor, physical therapist, all the all the above. And so this is kind of when we were in a hospital tour. Um, and the picture in the middle was uh, this guy named Dom, who was the first uh, biomedical engineer, actually met in real life. And he kind of gave me an understanding of what biomedical engineering was. And after that, I knew that I wanted to pursue that for my undergraduate major as a pre-medicine person. And so fast forward, um, go to college from 2011 to 2015. Um, but, you know, work, working my way up the ranks to graduate at the top of my class in high school, um, you know, it's really, it's, really, it's really easy to do well. It wasn't easy, but it was easy enough to do well in high school when not a lot of people actually care about trying to go to college. And so I moved up the ranks really high. But when I got to college um, was when I realized, I really started to realize the academic gaps I possessed relative to my peers um, in, a, in an ocean full of pre-meds from people who come from different backgrounds, <clears throat> you know, not being first generation and whatnot. I really struggled and I struggled to do basic things in, in the textbooks and the lectures. And so I found myself just really struggling as a biomedical engineering major and as a pre-med and being the first one in my family to do it. And very few people in my class to go to college. It was like, I felt kind of alone. Um, as well, as part of uh, my, my scholarship and my ability to go to college and pay for it, I was fortunate to be part of uh, Arizona Assurance Scholars, which is kind of like a subsidized um, uh, merit-based merit -based and need-based scholarship. Um, that helped fund my education, but part of that involved me having to also have a work-study job on campus. And so I worked for a catering company on campus uh, about 40, uh, 20 to 40 hours a week. And so that really kind of also added, uh, didn't allow me to study more, so I struggled a lot. And uh, part of also not only struggling, I didn't really understand like how to ask for help. I didn't even think I had the ability to ask for help at that because I made it to college and therefore I got to kind of suck it up and go through it. Um, and also I was just kind of like a little bit ignorant. I thought that I didn't need the help. I didn't really want to ask for it. I didn't even know how to ask for help. And so, but ultimately, you know, I, was, I, I had a lot of reflection after about two or three semesters of college and my GPA tumbled and I started to lose in scholarships. And I realized I needed to take ownership of my shortcomings, no matter what the situation was that I got into my, myself into. And so I, I acknowledged my shortcomings. Um, I took ownership of them. I acknowledged my limitations and I recognized the ability to ask for help to build the necessary uh, study habits to thrive. And after that, you know, started to uh, seek out tutoring services, visit office hours, and built a support support system of uh, peers and mentors. Um, ultimately, I ended up finishing with a good upward trend in my last two and a half years of college. But even then, I was only able to secure a cumulative a science cumulative GP of 2.5 and 2.9, and respectively. Um, and so, in college, I did do a lot of pre-med stuff. I um, mean, I was involved with organizations and and, and uh, leadership and whatnot. Here's a picture of me going on a, on a medical brigade to Panama, uh, connecting with a lot of people who needed help out there. Um, and then ultimately, you know, I was able to graduate. A college was was uh, was pretty hard at the beginning. It really kicked my butt. But after that, you know, I, I was able to graduate in four years. I was able to make it out. I came out, you know, a lot better uh, as a student academically, um, but my GPA was still low. And the reality of it is, it wasn't until after college that I really started to realize um, what it took to get to medical school. So I feel like a lot of people go to college and that's where you're really supposed to discover yourself, figure yourself out, and part of it did, but I feel like my real growth and my real evolution didn't come until after college uh, between 2015 and now, right? 
And so I kind of had to reinvent myself. I had to kind of figure out, okay, what does it actually take to get into medical school? And so even though my journey, again, my dream started in 2010 when I did the MedStar program in high school, it wasn't until 2015 that I really started to learn what it took to, to, to get to medical school. So I started to ask myself, you know, what is a medical school application? What is the MCAT really? And how do I really prepare for it? And as you can see here in the title, like I, my first two MCATs were 46 and a 490, right? Because um, I have a little meme here for you guys. Essentially, I started to ask myself, oh, like I started to realize that the medical school application in itself and the MCAT is literally a whole other world that I didn't even know about. And here's a fun, here's a pun, right? Like it always has been, kid. Like it always has been like that. And I feel like a lot of stuff is really hard to learn until you really start getting to the into into the neck deep into it. Um, in college, I did do a, a Kaplan course in, in my senior year, 2014, 2015, but I never I never really found it helpful. I wasn't really committed. I didn't really understand what was going on. And so at that time in college, I never took MCAT. Um, it wasn't until after college that I studied over the summer, studied. Um, and uh, by study, I mean the fact that you know, I only, uh, I just read some of the concept books and took no foolings and thought that was going to be good enough. And the results showed um, in the fall 2015, I took it and I scored a 486. And I was like, oh, shoot, like this is going to be with me forever. But I started to kind of just start start learning more about what does it really take to, to take the MCAT. Um, and, you know, retrospectively or in hindsight, I wish the future of me would have stopped me. I wish I would have somebody to stop me and tell me, don't do it. Don't do it, kid. <laughs> Um, but again, not having supporters or mentors really like we have now on social media. I feel like it's, it's really easy to find mentors now if you really want to get out there. But back then, 2015, it wasn't as big. And so there was no next step. There was no blueprint. There was no U world. Um, and, and, you know, the results showed when I didn't know how to take full or really study. Um, but regardless, I carried on. At that time, I obviously didn't apply to medical school. Um, that was still a whole other thing that I still had to learn. But right, I kind of started to retake. I realized my shortcomings and I started to take some of my prereqs, my science courses, I started taking them at a community college. Um, it's kind of like a do-it-yourself post back. So going from college or university to community college, you know, started taking some of them to new science courses. And I was starting to get my clinical experience. So I started to volunteer and I was volunteering up, up until three hospitals at the same time simultaneously. And then I got a job as a pharmacy tech. Um, that was entirely in my 2015, essentially. In 2016, um, this is when I took the actual MCAT a second time and that was when I got the 490. Um, and at the time as well, like I was working full time in 2016 as an MA in the beginning of 2016. Um, and that was like an eight to five during business hours. And then I started working as a scribe on the weekends. So I had two jobs. So I worked eight to five Monday to Friday as an MA and on the weekends I worked two 12 hour shifts in the ER. And I did that for 12 months, uh, for 10 months, sorry. And so during that time, I literally was getting so much experience and it was so rewarding, but it was also very challenging. But I got to experience what it was like to be at the bedside from the private clinic to the OR setting because I was in ophthalmology, so I got to go to the OR and then ER. Um, and during that time, you know, I really started documenting my journey. I took this picture um, right before night shift overnight when I was kind of just saw some motivation, right? Like only this is Dr. Parking only. Um, and so I remember this picture. I had this picture, uh, you know, on my phone. I had it in my background. And then I started to, uh, you know, kind of just start studying for the MCAT again. I knew I wanted to take it a second time um, while doing all this, while working full time and doing all these things and trying to volunteer. And, uh, you know, tell myself again that maybe the first one was a fluke. I didn't really take any full length, kind of just reviewed content. I felt stronger now having some clinical experience. Um, but then I took it in fall 2016 and I scored a 490. So at this point, I had a 46, a 490 with my second one. And I was like, kind of just, again, devastated. Um, I didn't apply to medical school, but I did apply to a five year MDMS linkage program offered at my local state school. Um, you need to be a state resident and everything. And about 400 people apply because you have to meet the criteria. Um, and the interview about, uh, 33 for 10 spots. And I interviewed and I took this picture here as well, trying to uh, document my journey of what it was like interviewing, how, how blessed and how grateful I felt to be there. Ultimately, you know, it was humbling to just be there, to be allowed to share my journey and my aspirations, but I still felt short. Um, you know, I didn't get accepted. And uh, so I started to reflect again on my academic, personal, professional experiences, my shortcomings, and I started to weigh my options to backup plan. Not a backup plan from plan A, which is to go to medical school and to be in medicine, but what can I do since this SMP didn't take me to continue to evolve myself personally, professionally, academically? And so I applied to other programs. Ultimately, I ended up choosing, I opted for a research intensive master's program in my local medical school. Um, and again, the point here is to always have a plan A. Plan is always a goal, but you must always be 10 steps ahead of your future self and have a backup on the back of a backup. So if I wasn't going to get an SMP, what was I going to do to make my own do it yourself SMP? What was I going to do to continue to improve myself for the next following year? Um, that ultimately led to 2017, 
where I gained the ability to have to start my master's degree. And in that, um, during that year, I also, you know, not only did I have basic science research experience through my master's program, um, but it was a translational program. Um, and I also got clinical research experience, which I'll get into a little bit right now. And this is actually the first time I started to apply to medical school was 2018. But before I get there, in early 2017, I started my MS. I quit my job as an MA and I started working as a scribe only. And so between my graduate courses during the day or the afternoons, I worked a lot of overnight shifts in the ER. And, I, and in the mornings, I would spend my time doing my lab bench research as part of my master's degree. And again, this is a really tough time trying to juggle it all. But here I have a picture of me when I first started my master's degree in the research lab in the background. You can see here, and this is a picture of me and uh, one of my mentors, Patricia. And she was actually the director of the program that I started in 2010, the MESTAR program. And we kept the longevity and the long-term relationship as one of my mentors, um, and ultimately one of my letter writers. And so if she's watching, a special shout out to her because she was one of the first people that believed in me uh, when I was still in high school. And so when the program opened, um, the program started and I joined the lab, I invited her to the opening of this new building and she was kind of my plus one. So um, yeah, uh, you know, it's really important to always remember with the people who believed in you when no one else did. And so it's a picture of her. Um, by the end of 2017, um, I had already finished all my courses. I finished my graduate science GPA with uh, 3.58, about 90 credits hours worth. Um, and at the end of that, because I no longer had courses, I started to actually just project a lot of my time in 2018 to my lab bench research, um, as well as I quit the job as an ER scribe and I started to work. I applied for another job and I started to work as a clinical research coordinator. So now I was getting the experience that I needed from a basic translational clinical research site. Um, and I started working for my local medical school. So at that point, I was kind of plugged in with the medical school. I was working at the university hospital. And then I was also in the research lab for the same medical school um, in the cardiology department. And so here I have a cool, cool picture of a case that I was in. This is a, a TAVR, a trans, uh, transcatheter aortic uh, valve replacement. And just kind of with a cool role to be able to be in, in a role where I was uh, in medical devices, clinical trials. Um, and so now I finally felt whole. I felt good enough to shoot my shot to apply to medical school for the first time. And this is the 2018, 2019 cycle. Um, but I wanted to do it right because this is gonna be my first, my third MCAT attempt. And I wanted to find, I can prepare my first real application. Um, but I knew I needed to invest in professional help. And this is where I hired a uh, next step tutor and uh, started working with Dr. Gray personally one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and again, at this time is when I truly started to be introspective with the culmination of all my experiences academically, professionally, and personally. And this is kind of my theme, right? You always have to reflect on who you are outside of the academic world, personally, who are you professionally and who ultimately how that makes you who you are and who you aspire to be. Um, so I uh, applied in, in, in 2018. However, I had taken the MCAT the third time. Um, this time it was September, 2018. I got my score back in October and I got a 492. I had only gone up two points, even though I worked really hard with a tutor. Um, but there's a lot of details to this, um, but a lot of it I own to myself um, in the sense of like, you know, juggling so many things, it's really hard to, to commit to research to working full time and then having to study. And I'll get a little bit more into like learning how to cut, cut back on things, to prioritize the things that really matter, like the MCAT. But at the time, again, I felt so defeated. I remember the, I remember the, the moment very clearly. It was a Monday morning when I got the email that I scored a 492 and I was devastated. Um, and so I spent the following day just kind of just, you know, morning defeated, reflecting, you know, and just trying to take ownership of where I fell short. And at the time, I had only, I had only added three schools to my MCAS, my two state schools and one out of state. And so at that point, I decided I didn't want to move forward because like with secondaries to have a complete application because I feel like no school would ever need me. No one would really take a shot at me with the 492. And so I kind of closed that figurative chapter in my life or that, of that cycle, excuse me. But three days later is when I received an invitation to interview for an out of state school that was in the Midwest. And the reason why was because that school didn't require a secondary. Um, and so I, you know, it, it's, it was a roller coaster of emotions. I had, I had woken up Monday morning to a 492, not the best school that I wanted. And then fast forward by the end of that week, I had an interview to, to a medical school an MD medical school. And, uh, you know, this is the first time in my life. Um, so that was in October and the medical school interview was going to be in January. And this was the first time in my life that I was a thousand miles away from my home pursuing my dreams. And it felt so surreal to like, just remember how far I had come from where I was, right? Like you guys have seen my journey so far, like from my upbringing to college, to reflection, to falling short in the S&P. And then now finally being interviewing with the 492, trying to shoot my shot and trying to finally show them, you know, why I'm worthy of being in medicine and why I want to be in medicine. And I remember that night really clearly at like that trip. I remember just uh, being a thousand miles away from home, being in my Airbnb. And I remember just calling my mom and trying to like, you know, share my dreams and everything with the people um, that have been supporting me through the dream, through the journey. And I remember interview day, I felt like a dream because, you know, walking on campus with all these infamous people that like, you know, uh, it just everybody in medicine, they're trying to pursue medicine, inspiring each of us with our own story. 
and here's a picture of uh, of the the campus. Um, so normally I would ask the chat right now, like if anybody can try to figure out what school this is, um, just to see like kind of like a little pop quiz. But because I can't see the chat, I'm gonna just keep going. Um, but essentially, um, you know, this is the medical school, and if whoever can figure it out, it's Indiana University. And again, just like my disclaimer in the beginning, um, I, everything that I share with you guys is a case study. This doesn't mean go apply to Indiana. Again, why they interview me, it's a whole other reason with the 492, but the whole point here is to try to prove to you guys that you are more than numbers to try to define you. Even though the 492, I didn't believe in myself, but they did believe in me, and they did give me an opportunity, and not many did. And I never, never would have known who else would have given me an opportunity had they not like sent me an invitation to interview because they didn't have a secondary application. Uh, so this is a quick picture that I took when I was there. It was snowing, being from Arizona. This was horrible, but I loved it. It was it was an amazing feeling. And so again, just um, I did a lot of reflecting when I was there. I remember like just feeling so grateful and so humble because just remembering like how far my parents came from where they were to where I was, I felt very privileged to be there, to be coming from you know, uh, um, the ranchos and the ranchers from Mexico to them being into a, a world-renowned medical institution was, was very humbling. So, um, unfortunately, they didn't send me. I was not admitted because they did give me feedback. Um, I spoke to the director of missions and he told me that the reason was uh, a lot of it came down to the competitiveness of the of the MCAT scores and the interview pool. But again, I was just grateful for the opportunity. And so I kind of did a lot of reflecting. It, it felt really good to finally have an opportunity to know that it was finally worthy. Um, and so going into the 2019 cycle, <coughs> excuse me, I needed to uh, do a lot of reflection. I knew that I wanted to do it alone this time. And so going to my fourth MCAT, I wanted to do a lot of self-study. And kind of what I touched on earlier today, or last one, was uh, I needed to cut back on responsibilities. I knew that in order for me to do well in the MCAT, which is the one thing stopping me from getting to medical school, was that something had to give. I had to cut back responsibilities. I couldn't do everything else in a day and do the MCAT at the end of the day. It wasn't, it just wasn't gonna work. The MCAT needed to be first. And so I dedicated my summer. Uh, I took a vacation leave from my work and I just dedicated my summer to studying. I took the MCAT again in September of 2019. Well, revamping my MCAS because, you know, just trying to redo my experiences and everything, my personal statement. Um, and then again, got the MCAT late in October. And at the time I had only decided to apply to three schools, but, um, you know, I got my score back in, in October and I got a 497. Not the best, but I was damn proud because I worked really hard to get it up. I had really hard to, to work on my score and, and I put in the work. And, you know, it wasn't the best, but I knew that, you know, I put it in. So I put it in the work, so I was happy and I was proud of it. And during that time, again, I went to to war with me versus the man in the mirror. I reminded myself of why I'm here, and I realized I no longer wanted to wait to become a doctor or student doctor to do things that I was always passionate about. I had a vision of how I want to be a student doctor, how I want to be a doctor. Um, but instead of doing that, I started to do those things now. Uh, and that, a lot of that came into, involved into serving my community and doing things that a lot of people – a lot of things that I wish that, that I want to do in the future, but I started to do them instantly. And uh, because of that, I kind of had a lot of clarity on the type of doctor that I needed to be, not want to be, but I needed to be. And so um, with that, you know, I kind of started to really pick my school list to schools that were going to help me become the person I needed to become. And at that time, I went to UC Davis for that conference. This is pre-pandemic. This is 2019 in, in the fall. And I, I ended up, before the uh, conference, I ended up adding like 22 other schools. So I did like 22 secondaries in a week before the conference. And here's a picture of me and Dr. Gray, uh, finally meeting him in person at the conference. And I got to really network with schools, got to put myself in front of a lot of schools and uh, in front of them, put a face to my application and a face to them. And really just kind of just tell them that I am more than my application and the numbers. Um, here's another picture as well from the WMC conference, which happened a month later. Um, and me and my friend right there, one of my best friends, Jeffrey. And uh, and uh, yeah, I just went up, I showed up, I showed myself up and I try to advocate for myself, try to tell them why I needed to go to the school, not why I wanted to, but why I needed to. And ultimately, that led me to Milani four MD interviews in the 2019 cycle. Um, and so I got my interview again to Indiana. This is the score here on the left, um, or my left, left of the screen. And I got the interview by November. And again, interview the same date in January 15th. I got a second interview to my home school, which is the University of Arizona. Um, and then I got interview, a third interview when I landed in Indiana. Um, the day before my interview for, for St. Louis, and I felt like it was going to be another rejection. And here's a, a picture of the campus. And again, um, and then again, I got an interview for uh, for Tulane as well. Um, at that time, I had initially got rejected, but then I guess they decided to uh, reconsider me, gave me an invite to interview. And between all this, all these interviews occurred over six weeks. So we're just flying all over the place. This is right before the pandemic in, in the early 2020. Um, and so, yeah, I just felt really blessed, really privileged. I really felt this is my year. Um, I worked really hard to be here. And again, a lot of these schools, 
like, like again, I got to put a disclaimer. Like, doesn't mean go apply there if you have a low stats. These schools, the median averages for their MCAT, their averages for their uh, MCAT, the GPAs, I was light years away. I was one whole number away, not point one, but whole number away. And so this is why it's really important to figure out your why and where you want to be and pick the schools that are going to help you become who you need to become. Um, and so, uh, unfortunately, you know, I went to this interview with a guy with some wait lists. Um, and over the time, you know, for schools that waitlisted me, I sent updates, I sent the letters of intent, um, but I didn't get off. But again, I fell short. I didn't get in. Um, and as the pandemic flared, you know, things got delayed, postponed, but I didn't let that deter me or uh, 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 stop me from be continuing to work on the things that made me who I wanted to become. So again, uh, the primary application, it, it's where you have a lot of growth. The secondary is for you to be introspective and me just having an opportunity to interview was an honor and a privilege. And I was just so grateful for that. And acceptance is the dream, but I didn't let that stop me from who I wanted to become. And I continue to work on who, who I aspired to be every day. Um, again, unfortunately, I didn't get off the wait list, um, but I continued to prepare my, my application. I pre-wrote a lot of it. I submitted it this time on July 1st. Um, and a lot of things that I was able to highlight now that were new was I finished, I had my finished master's degree. I defended my thesis. I started working on initiatives in the community, specifically COVID related. I started to do a lot more grassroots pipeline initiatives with my high school and my local medical school. And I started to mentor a lot of other kids that were first gen disadvantaged in URM. I applied in medical school with me. So this is the past cycle, right? Now we just started a new cycle as of whatever yesterday. Uh, but this past cycle, 2020, 2021, um, you know, I started to really just prepare myself early, get into it. Um, and this time I had to take my MCAT the fifth time, but I had only dedicated six weeks to it. This is gonna be my, my fifth attempt and this is the COVID version. Um, so I took it in August and this time they were giving the scores back early. So by the end of August, I had my score. And my practice tests were doing well, you know, between 500 and 510, but I unfortunately scored a 497 again. Um, again, they're kind of defeated, but at least I was happy that it didn't go down. And it was not, it, was not, it wasn't worse, but it was the same. Um, and again, I was, I was just happy that it worked out. And most, more importantly, that my science scores peaked. My cars kind of remained the same. And my, my psych social was the thing that played me. It flopped for the first time ever compared to my diagnostic. Uh, but I, again, I was just proud of the, the, the science increase. It's something that you guys need to know. Um, we could probably get into this later, but a lot of schools take what's called a super score, which means they take the highest score in each section of every attempt you made and make like a new super composite score. So me having an increase in the sciences really helped kind of put me up for certain schools like George Washington and whatnot, um, which was, you know, why I was still happy at the end. And so, um, you know, throughout the last cycle, I, I ensured to keep in touch with all the schools that rejected me, and this is really important because even if they rejected me, interview me, waitlisted me, whatever the case, I try to build a genuine connection with somebody in admissions or somebody at that school to ask for feedback. Hey, I know you didn't give me an interview. I know I got rejected. I know that you guys probably have a lot of inquiries, but I want to know like from my own personal growth and, and, and development, like where did I fall short and what could I do better? And I always wanted to just see what they had to say. Uh, a lot of times it's really easy to just say your MCAT or your GPA, but I wanted to see if there was anything besides that. Um, and, you know, during that time, it allows for a lot of growth. And so, um, you know, you continue to put your application on your desk. The, the, least, the least I can say is say not now. Um, but you also get to learn what schools are going to be for you based on the feedback they give you. And kind of start building a genuine connection and always follow up on that. Um, so this time around, applying a, a third time, I had all my secondaries complete, a majority of them by the time my score came back. And then by the first week or two of September, I already finished like about, I think I did 30 primaries. And uh, at this time, I think I worked by 30 seconds at this time. And then finally, in November 2020, uh, November 20th of 2020, um, you know, I finally got accepted. But why is this important? Because of the, the feedback, right? Um, you know, I, I genuinely owe my first acceptance to a lot of the feedback and, and keeping in touch with people in admissions. And, you know, again, some of them might deny you feedback, but you never know and it doesn't hurt to ask, even if the website says otherwise. Um, you know, some schools uh, listened, others didn't. Um, and, you know, you also learn about what schools are going to be for you. If a school tells me that they want a certain score for cars, then I know that's not going to be a school for me because they're, they're not looking at anything besides my car score. They're not willing to look at my evolution, my growth, my trends, why I have more to offer on critical thinking because I have a master's and a research degree. Um, and so kind of also learn about a lot about that. And so, so while some deny you, you kind of discover which schools are for you. Others might take the time to truly listen and advise you. And to this day, you know, some of the most powerful and growth conversations that I've had with people um, happen to be because of, of being able to reach out to them. And, you know, regardless of the outcome, just keep in touch. Even if it doesn't work in your favor, again, you, you generally want to get invested with these people. Um, and the med community is, is very small. And so ultimately, 
this led to me uh um me being able to ultimately be accepted here's a this past year was new university and then ultimately i got accepted and so here it is picture of me in the medical school that said to me unfortunately i ultimately didn't decide on that and i was really heartbroken but this is the first school and i took this picture a year to the date from the conference to the time i got accepted and it all came into fruition here's just me sharing my uh, my moment with my mother and so yeah. the day, I, have a, I have a lot of advice and i know we're running out of time but i just want to tell you guys at the end of the day um, you know, reflect on who you are, choose schools are going to be, who are going to help you become who you need to become and use every experience as growth. And if you don't apply, um, you know, you don't, you're never going to know, but if you do apply, it's going to be better than 0%. And so, yeah. I love this story, Brian. I mean, everybody in the chat is just overcome. Um, there was a period there where you were a little choky and you might've been feeling your feels or you might've been having a cold or it might've been both, but no. like it was making all of us like, <laughs> um, and, and yeah, I mean, I don't know how many times Ryan Gray and I have said your stats are not your story and you are a hundred percent proof of that. I think you're a real testament to staying positive. Like just, you know, I know you lived this, but throughout that presentation, you would tell us a thing and it would be easy to be downtrodden by that thing. And it's not that you didn't feel sad, but you found a positive piece and you kept going. And that is so important. And that's going to matter, not just through the process that's taking you to where you are now, but going forward to get through the four years at Tulane, to get through your career as a doctor, you've got to find a way to stay well and you're really doing it. Um, so yeah, I think um, everybody was just thrilled to hear that story. I'm sorry that we don't have time to do questions, but maybe one day we can have you back for a more detailed session. Um, I do wanna plug some of the groups you'd mentioned. So I put up before where people can find you, but I know you said that there are some groups that you find to be really helpful. Um, Latinx and Medicina and Bridging Admissions. We had some folks from Me Mentor earlier today. There's a lot of places to get mentorship out there. Um, and it sounds like that's part of how you made your success is by getting help wherever you could get it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the kind words. And yeah, I was getting a little bit of a choky just thinking about it and also like just a cough. So, um, come an issue of it all, but yes, um, you know, my IG handles there, my Twitter from hood to MD, just at the title of the presentation, you know, always DMs are always open. I know what it's like. And then a plug into the people that I've worked with as far as mentorship, you know, I mentor, bridging emissions i do a lot of it personally too but with medical school starting soon i'm pretty sure i'll have to come back on that and mm -hmm. uh you know uh yeah i want to plug in latinx and medicina i mean thought because uh like i said in the beginning like it's really hard to believe you can do something without seeing someone that can do it and when i was going to college i wish i would have had that social media connection to connect with other people kind of going through it so you know your first generation disadvantage or him or whatever you need someone to talk to like we're always going to be there all of us and the whole point is to pay it forward mm -hmm. great so guys, what's gonna happen now is the yellow room is gonna close for the day and um, we're gonna head over to the blue room for our wrap up session and raffle winners. Um, Brian, it's just always such a pleasure to interact with you. You are a joy to many people. I cannot wait to hear about your amazing career. Thank you so much. I can't wait to share it with you guys. And thank you for being thank here. You. Thank you guys for everything you do behind the scene as well.